So I want to do a deep dive into Durkheim and Durkheim's understanding of culture, um, in part because Durkheim serves as really a foundational theorist for the sociology of culture. And from my perspective, one of Durkheim's great contributions is to the understanding of culture. And today I want to, I'm going to talk about Durkheim's understanding of social forms, an idea I introduced you to in an earlier lecture and to look at his study of religious life, which I hinted at, but we're going to look at much more detail, in a detailed way, um, we'll focus on a distinction between the sacred and the profane, and we'll emphasize Durkheim's definition of religion, which I'm going to extend to understand culture more generally. So as you may remember, Durkheim is one of the um, classic theorists and really sociologists um, uh, uh, that scholars of sociology identify as being central to the formation of our discipline. And Durkheim uh, uh, lived in France uh, um, from the end of the 19th century to the um, um, early part of the 20th century and was an enormously prolific writer who also was essential to constructing sociology as a discipline. And the book that we're going to talk about today is his book, The Elementary Forms of Religious Life. Um, and that book draws in part on Durkheim's idea of forms, or the idea that in societies there are forms, or sort of abstract, yet nonetheless consistent phenomenon that, we exi that exist across all societies, and that the project of a sociologist is to come to understand those forms is to come to, to make sense of what the form of a particular, of, of, of human society is. So um, I didn't do a great job with that, but the, the idea here is like all societies have some kind of religion and religion exists as a form. There's an abstract form that is religion. And what sociologists need to understand is not really the particular interest instance of religion. We don't need to know really specifically you know, the difference between Catholicism and Protestantism or Islam and Buddhism or Zoroastrianism. Instead, what we should do is think about how are all of those things representative of an overall form? And so Durkheim takes as his inquiry in the elementary forms of religious life, an inquiry of what are the basic features or contours of the form of religion? And in order to do this, what Durkheim does is draw upon a series of studies of religion in Aboriginal communities, um, primarily in Australia. Durkheim doesn't do any research himself on this. That is, he doesn't do any primary or original research. What he instead does is draw upon the studies of other people, anthropologists, who went into these communities and studied how it was that they practiced what we might think of as religion. Now, why study an Aboriginal community? Well, for Durkheim, the reason was sort of kind of straightforward to him. Insofar as religion exists as a form, that is, insofar as it has the sort of abstract feature of which all instances of religion adhere, it's better to study, from Durkheim's perspective, a simple religion as opposed to a complicated one. So as the division of labor advances, Durkheim claims, forms get more complicated. And so rather than study a super complicated form, why not study a more basic one, one deep, more deeply tied to his idea of organic solidaristic systems? Now, to take a step back, I would criticize this of Durkheim. I would say, I'm not really convinced that like the societies he was studying were simpler or the more the modes of religious observation were more simple or basic. Um, I think that there's a little bit of a colonialist assumption built into that. But nonetheless, he still can generate really interesting insights about the dynamics of religion through this mode of inquiry, through this way of trying to think about what it is that's central to a religion. Now, if we think about religion for a moment, we might initially say, well, obviously religion are the set of beliefs that people have, in part because often religious observers emphasize the beliefs that they hold, 
what it is that the texts that they adhere to say, and how it is that those weigh upon them. In other words, religion is a set of values that people have, values that are taught to them about, through a book. Durkheim is going to say, that's not really true. He's not going to say that values don't matter. He's not going to say that beliefs don't matter. But he's going to argue that it's totally incomplete and that to fully understand religion, we cannot just rely upon the idea of beliefs. A second way of thinking about religion is to say, well, no, no, no. Religion is clearly not about the beliefs that you have, or it is maybe about the beliefs that you have, but central to religion is an understanding of the divine, of God. And here Durkheim also is going to say, well, actually, when we look at a wide range of religions, God isn't always super important. God is not actually the central feature of religion. Some religions have conceptualizations of magic, where they think about these things that transcend human capacity, but the divine is not central to that, or the concept of God or a God isn't really foundational to religion. Many scholars are going to build upon um, Durkheim in this. And in fact, in the United States, there's an entire um, research trajectory on what we call civil religion coming out of Durkheim's insight which thinks about what is the sort of religious sensibility of a collective group of people independent of the idea of God. And so the second idea that Durkheim takes on is not just that religion isn't simply about values, but it's not really about the divine either. Instead, Durkheim notes a few things. One of them is a distinction between the sacred and the profane. The profane are everyday things. And the sacred are things that are removed, those things that are not everyday objects. Now, this distinction, interestingly, is not just about the quality of the object itself. So I want to return to the first lecture that I gave on culture and say, you know, I pointed out that when thinking about culture, we shouldn't just think about the quality of objects. One of the things that we should think about here um, when, not, when saying not simply the quality of objects is to think about who or how it is that people relate to those objects. What is the relationship between people and objects? And we might note that sacred objects are often mundane in certain contexts but are transformed into being sacred through some process. I'm going to give you two examples of this. One from what we would think of as a classic religious example, and then the second is going to be from a civil religious example. So um, I said to you earlier that my mom is from Ireland, and as you might suspect if you know anything about Ireland, my mom is Catholic because of this um, and grew up in a Catholic context. So in Catholicism there is a critical thing that happens at every mass, which is communion wafers, which are given to um, the congregants or the, 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 the group of believers and wine that is given. But, and those communion wafers and the wine are sacred objects. That is, they have a kind of special place. They are not every day. But interestingly, they are also mundane objects, or they are initially mundane objects. So a communion wafer is just a piece of bread. It's just simply a little wafer of bread. And wine is something that was, and even is, very commonly consumed. So bread and wine are mundane. And yet, there's something that happens over the course of a Catholic Mass that transforms these mundane or everyday objects into sacred objects, into things that are not everyday, but that are quite special. And the thing that happens during a Catholic Mass is a ritual. There's a ritual that the priest goes through in order to transform 
the bread into, in the Catholic terms, the body of Christ, and the wine into the blood of Christ. And the object transforms, in some ways, magically from a mundane to a sacred thing. Now, rather than think like, oh, this is just how Catholics are strange kinds of people, I want you to think about other objects in our lives that can be transformed through a collective ritual from something that's mundane to something that's really special. If you're an American, like I am, one such object is turkey. And I mean here turkey, the bird that um, people eat. So one of the most important American holidays for many Americans is Thanksgiving. And um, Thanksgiving is this um, celebration primarily among white Americans, I must say. Native Americans do not have a positive relationship to this holiday for very good reason. But among uh, many white Americans and also immigrants, Thanksgiving is a time to give thanks to one's family. It's also a time where many, many American families eat turkey. Now, turkey happens to be one of the most mundane physical objects that you can consume. If I were to say to you, I'm going to give you something incredible. It's going to be amazing. You're going to be so excited when I give it to you. And then you see what it is, and it's a turkey sandwich. You're going to think to yourself, there is nothing special about turkey. And yet, on Thanksgiving, <clears throat> the turkey is transformed somehow into a sacred object. It gets moved from the, el from the area of the mundane and the everyday into the area of the sacred or the special. And that transformation of turkey from the mundane to the sacred is partially through a range of ritual and symbolic practices. We talk about how do we cook it. We surround it with certain sets of things. We gather together in a very particular way. We tend to eat at a specific time, which is actually not a normal time to eat. It's neither lunch nor dinner. It's often around like two or three or four o'clock. All of these things are ways in which the turkey gets set apart from its mundaneness and transforms itself into a sacred object. There are so many examples of this that you can then begin to think about. How it is that flags, as we said in an earlier lecture, get transformed into sacred objects. They are just pieces of cloth. But yet through some form of collective representation and collective ritual, we transport them from pieces of cloth into something greater, something more sacred. We have rules about how they're, how they're brought up a flagpole, how it is that they rise, how it is that they come down what they can touch, they shouldn't touch the ground, how it is that we fold them, what we do with them at special po points in time. We may lower them to half-mast as a symbolic representation of national loss. All of these things transport mundane objects into sacred objects. In Durkheim's sense, then, this distinction between the sacred and the profane it's partially tied to how it is that he understands religious processes. And here, you can think of religious processes as the beliefs and practices that come together in a community. So, as I said before, it's not that Durkheim disagrees that religion is about belief, but he says understanding religion as a belief system is totally insufficient in part because we require two other things for a religion to be a religion. And we're going to talk a lot more about this in the religion section of this course. For now, I want us to, I'm going to extend this to think about Durkheim's understanding of religion to culture. So in addition to beliefs, there have to be a set of practices, or in the terms that I've been using, ritual practices that are central to religion, that transform a mundane object into or experience into something that's special. In the Jewish tradition, for example, you don't physically touch religious texts. You don't touch them with your hand um, um, because to do so would pollute them. And so there are a set of practices or ritual practices around objects that transform them into something much more sacred. So beliefs are insufficient to Durkheim. What we also need are rituals or collective practices. And this introduces us to the third element. 
a church. Now, if you think of a church, you may think of a physical building, you know, that looks like maybe a Christian church or something like that. That's not what Durkheim had in mind. What he has in mind here is a community of believers, a group and practitioners, a group of people who have roughly the same set of beliefs and shared practices in order to create these sacred or transcendental moments that are meaningful for us. So central to a religion is not just the beliefs, but the practices, and that the beliefs and practices become collective in order to have collective or shared representations in Durkheim's ideas. And here, we might transport then Durkheim outside of the context of religion to an understanding of culture and what culture is. And the definition that I want to give you, the Durkheimian definition of culture, will be how symbols are enacted through collective rituals to create shared meanings in the world how symbols are enacted through collective rituals to generate shared meaning in the world. There are three elements then to a cultural Durkheimian approach. The first is the ways in which symbols, some form of collective representation exists. How those symbols are not just conceptual, but they're enacted through a collective ritual. And that that collective ritual is central to meaning making. So profane things are kind of often habitual and boring. boring. They, they frequently, in, in Durkheim's sense, don't create a lot of meaning. Sacred things create a lot of meaning. They generate huge amounts of meaning to us. But they're also relatively exhausting. So they relatively like, they, they like, you can't actually participate in them all the time. If we served Thanksgiving meal once a week, it would cease to be special to people. I mean, we would put on a lot of weight, but we would also like suddenly find it tremendously boring. The sacred is in some ways removed from the everyday and has to be removed from the everyday to have its special qualities. I want you to think about in your own life, what are the sets of symbols that get enacted through collective rituals to generate shared meaning? Food is often a really good example of this. Special kinds of food that are eaten at particular periods in time that can be eaten at other periods in time, but that through some kind of ritual or collective process are transported to be special. You know, um, in the Middle East, there may be particular kinds of rice dishes where this is the case. Rice is a mundane object to eat. It's not really special at all but that there's something about particular periods in time and particular rituals of production of rice that transport it to symbolize something greater. In parts of Asia, there are dumplings often that do this. Pieces of food that are eaten every day, all the time. But at certain periods in time, there are some special kinds of dumplings that are produced, that are produced and consumed ritualistically with other people to generate an important, meaningful moment. We might ask then, what are the symbolic things that exist in our lives that we collectively enact to generate shared meaning? Essential to this, absolutely essential, is the view of the collectivity or how it is that we come together and work together in order to generate this kind of phenomenon. It's not just that the symbols are out there. It requires work that we all have to do. And importantly, none of it is individual. The ways in which religion is enjoyed and participated may be, may happen on an individual basis, but the symbolic element of religion is collectively constituted through a shared set of rituals. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're all together, but it's a way in which we do things in association or dialogue with other people who are doing something similar. Now, obviously, this tells us a lot about religion, but it can also tell us a lot about a broader cultural cultural phenomenon. 
what are those sacred moments where things, symbolic elements gets transformed through a collective ritual in order to generate shared meanings? In the United States, you might think, for example, about the Super Bowl and how it is that the Super Bowl turns into a symbolic realm wherein we take these sort of collective representations of what it means, like, you know, city or state pride is on the line, and then there are rituals. People get together, they eat specific kinds of food, they watch ads in a, in a very sort of um, ritualized way, and it ends up being meaningful for us. The sets of cultural meanings that we de develop in these moments are ephemeral. They're just temporary moments, but they spill over. These sacred moments spill over into the mundane or the profane or the everyday in important ways. So I'd like you at the end of this lecture to take a step back and think. It could be about religion in the classic sense of um, your own religious upbringing and experience, but it also could be, and I would encourage you to think about, even if you have had a religious upbringing, other elements where we draw upon this conceptualization of Durkheim's of how it is that there are symbolic resources in the society that we're a part of, that we draw upon those symbolic resources, that we enact them through ritual practices in order to transform those symbols into sacred things and how that transformation generates meaning for us. So think of an example in your own life. It could be going to a sporting event and the symbol that you're doing is wearing the right kind of color or sweatshirt that represents something, that you do that with other people and there are particular rituals that you follow at that event. Maybe there's a particular way that you cheer or there's an object that you bring that is important as a part of it and how that transcendental moment creates meaning for you. Those meaning-making moments are typically moments where the individual disappears and the collective ritual and symbolic becomes more and more important. We lose our sense of individual consciousness and begin to develop a collective conscience or a collective consciousness, which creates a shared meaning system across all of us. And we can think of that shared system of meaning as culture.